this morning we spoke about innovation as it relates to stadium remodels in order to prepare clubs and their football grounds to take them into the future so that they can best maximize the potential that these stadiums have. Well, staying with this theme of innovation, which obviously is a thread that we have throughout the whole day in general, we're now going to have a chat about a definitive how-to in securing the future by investing in talent and technology, especially as it pertains to football. It's a really fascinating roundtable. It's brought to you by 2.0, Turkey's first sports venture capital, which invests in tech-driven and disruptive startups in the media, sports, and entertainment industries. So let's give it up for our moderator for this next panel. For you, you have Julie Kassap, founder of NOSC. We'll be coming out here in just a moment. OK, I guess she's getting wired up. So one minute. OK. Well, I guess you have one minute to talk amongst yourselves, to chat, to grab a bite to eat, coffee, tea, a drink, anything that you would like or you can just stay put. And we can also remind you to open up the application if you already have it downloaded. You can download it if you haven't yet done so. You can pull some of the photos that have been uploaded throughout the day as well, if you so choose. And of course, you can then use those photos in any which way that you would like. So there you have it. Well, hopefully they will be able to come out here in just a moment. How are we doing, Jaime? Yeah? Nearly there. <laughs> All right. There we go. Almost. Almost. Not quite. Well, everyone enjoying themselves so far? Yeah? Good? Yeah? Learning a lot of good things? Things you can take away from this? I see people nodding along, yeah? What's the most interesting thing you've learned today, for example? Yeah, you. Wonderful. As an engineer and entrepreneur, meeting everyone has been very helpful for you. I can imagine that's the case for a lot of people as well. Doing a lot of networking today and meeting a lot of interesting people. Yeah, you? Oh my goodness, come on, really? You're already asking about lunch. <laughs> is that the question that everybody would like to have answered? When is lunch? <laughs> Okay, well, lunch is at the end, obviously. It'll probably be around 2 o'clock-ish. Does that work for you? A couple more hours? Can you hang on in there? Yeah. Um, well, more about lunch later on. <laughs> now we're going to go ahead and invite out our next panel, our fireside chat, which is going to be led by Julie Kassa, founder of NOSC. So let's give it up for Julie, please. Hello, please come over here. This is the moderator chair. You doing okay? Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Still alive. Still alive. That's what we want to hear. Great. And also, let's give a warm welcome to Uzgur Gundwan, founder and general manager of Fantasy. Ah, right. Okay. So a little patience required then as we get everybody mic'd up and ready to go. Welcome, welcome. You have a moment. You have three more people coming out, so you've got the opportunity to get the microphone on and ready to go. <laughs> Next, we have Ali Akchai, managing partner of Scoutium. Let's give him a round of applause. Lovely. So see, he's ready to go. Well done. Welcome. Barish Hojaolu, the general manager of sports. All right, cutting straight to the chase, going straight to his chair. And last but not least, we have Yit Arslan, the general partner of Two Zero Ventures. All right, well, whenever you're ready, Julie, the floor is yours. Uh, now I'm okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Samra. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here, especially to see so many familiar faces and so many nice colleagues and experienced colleagues and having now this talk uh, sponsored by 2.0. So 2.0 is Turkey's first uh, venture capital. 
investing in tech-driven startups in sports, media, and entertainment. And we would like, first of all, to talk about 2.0 EAT, who is responsible, first of all, for the investments there as an investment director. So, Yeet, first of all, a little introduction about yourself and also about 2.0. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. So, uh, as you said, 2.0 is Turkey's first sports media entertainment fund. Uh, it was established back in 2020. <laughs> Uh, with like Parish, uh, great idea, I would say, because at that time we were also in uh, in works of uh, coming up with another VC fund as well, and we introduced both uh, to the market at around the same time. So um, actually, this is like investing in a vertical uh, in technology. So this is pretty common in uh, in the world, but when it comes to uh, sports media and entertainment, you see that there are only uh, a few funds doing that, uh, I would say. I mean, not more than uh, maybe 15 in the world, I would say, uh, mostly concentrated in the US. And I can also easily say that it's not only in Turkey, but it's one of the few funds in, in Europe as well. So up until today, we invested in uh, more than 15 technology startups that, uh, that focuses on uh, doing business in sports and media, I would say, and we see that there's a lot of interaction between those two verticals in itself as well. Uh, I mean, maybe we'll discuss later, but uh, there, is, there, is, there is more uni uniting uh, factors uh, between sports and media and lots of uh, monetization. Uh, in the in the in the intersection as well. So yeah, we'll discuss about all that. Yes, what's what's very unique about um, I think to zero is that you have an investment committee. You know where we are, and also some in the audience. We are having monthly or um, even shortly twice a month meetings where startups can present themselves, and then we can uh, learn more about the startups and feedback uh, to you then again. So if we see. I mean, you have been investing in so much tech lately. So what do you think are the technologies, uh, the upcoming technologies, you know, um, in the innovation uh, business, and especially in football? And why do you think will be these technologies important? Yeah, so <clears throat> coming up with the fund, uh, yeah. with, the, with the idea and with the strategy, so uh, it was mostly uh, leveraging on uh, lack of investments in this region to mm -hmm. sports and media uh, at an earlier stage for startups, I would say. Um, but uh, I think that leverage has never changed. I mean, since, since the last uh, three years, I think it's still the same. I think the technologies, uh, when it comes to sports and media, I think, I mean, the domains, I think, remain the same. I mean, when we started, it was ticketing, AR, VR. Mm -hmm. Um, I would I would say Web3 as well. I mean, it was uh, at a more earlier stage uh, and less monetization for Web3 projects, but it was there. Yeah. So I think it's still the same domains. Uh, the domains haven't changed a lot. Uh, but I think what we have uh, decided to leverage on was mostly uh, the inefficiency in the clubs, I would say. So when we take a look at the sports clubs, not only in football, but in, 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 in many sports, we see that we see where technology is today, how uh, how startups, early stage startups, and how uh, companies uh, monetize technology. And when you take a look at the clubs, I mean, you see uh, there is a lots of there is lots of fragmentation. Uh, there is uh, very inefficient situations, and actually, the fund uh, manages to build uh, build a bridge between that. Uh, between those inefficiencies, I would say. So, um, still, I think it's mostly fan engagement mm -hmm. uh, now. I think that's where the clubs are lacking a lot. I mean, despite the fact that they claim to introduce uh, lots of apps, technologies uh, to bridge that, I think there is still lots to do in fan engagement. Mm -hmm. But I think the biggest difference today in 2023 is we see very good examples of it and very bad examples of it. and maybe in for like 90% of the clubs, it's non-existent. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that's one of the largest domains. And I think the other one is athlete performance. I see 
uh, that's also up and coming. Uh, so yeah, we invest in all those do domains. Also, uh, uh, Serdar Sports ERP is one of our portfolio companies. Uh, he was in the previous panel. And uh, when we look at the way the clubs are managed, including all aspects, all dimensions, I think there is still a lot to do uh, yeah. on that end as well, yeah. Yeah, and especially when we analyze markets, you know, when we see in, in certain markets it's more professional and more digital, and certain markets still have a lack of that. So, but unfortunately, most people think when they say sport technology, it's mostly athletic performance. And this is the great thing about this phone that you really also pick, like in club management, like sports ERP or a different entertainment, you know, digital uh, di uh, fan token. We will talk about fantasy as well and also Scoutium. So, but important probably is also to know, is this fun just in Turkey or are you expanding? And my last question will then be also uh, to the crowd who are probably startup entrepreneurs want to get to know, of course, how can they apply and, you know, what to do. So the first question is like, about your phone, is it just based in Turkey, or are you looking outside? Yeah, I mean, we have we have a team of ten professionals, ten investment professionals that look into investing in startups uh, in the CE region. Mm -hmm. So that includes Turkey, Poland, uh, Czechia, Romania, um, Hungary, and also uh, Estonia. I mean, mm -hmm. Baltics as well. Uh, so, I mean, that also includes the sports tech and media tech. I mean, uh, the two zero domains. So we are looking into deals in the region, but uh, that just started this year. I mean, up until today, we were more focused on uh, doing investments in Turkey. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's going to change uh, by the end of this year. And I think we will be also planning to raise a second fund for 2-0 yeah. in 24. Uh, as soon as we, uh, I mean, we engage an, an anchor uh, that's more regional, I would say. Uh, yeah, so it's not only Turkey, I can easily say that. And uh, I can also say, I mean, there's a lot of interaction between, uh, I mean, we, we started observing a lot of interaction between uh, different verticals uh, within our mandate. So uh, for, for the next year and next one, we will be exploring more of those synergies as well. Like uh, we have invested into a local OTT. I mean, uh, imagine you can, uh, you can engage fans with, uh, with, with some of the content in a local OTT, and then you can take the engagement to a social media level, mm -hmm. and then you talk to a startup that can come up with the net asset value of your uh, social media assets, and then you can uh, pull some of those fans via engagement to the stadium, and then you can monetize in the stadium. I mean, there's, there's a lot of aspects to it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, most of the people think of it as athlete performance, but I think yeah. it, that's much, much more uh, beyond it. And uh, yeah. So um, what kind of advice are you giving now these aspiring entrepreneurs out there watching you now want to apply? Yeah, I would, I mean, I would, I would rather think of it as, as a more holistic, I mean, from a more holistic, holistic perspective, because I mean, whether you're an entrepreneur in sports, media or like uh, biotech, I think <laughs> it's pretty much the yeah. same. Uh, what, 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 I mean, the, the milestones are pretty much there. Um, I think my, my, my biggest advice would be to, uh, I mean, so this business is going to be not profitable for many years for any startup. I mean, that's startups are what we look in. Uh, most of the time, uh, they will burn cash for maybe even more than five years. So you should be at all times engaged with investors. You, you need to have a good understanding of what, uh, what the investors uh, think before investing, like what their criteria are. Uh, so you need to have uh, a good short list of investors always ready around you, including the friend, family, and fools. So that's one thing. But when it comes to sports and media, I see that due to the fact that there are lots of inefficiencies within those ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So what you see is there are people, I hope not in this room, uh, actually benefiting from all those inefficiencies. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, let's yeah. be honest. I mean, yes. if there is an inefficiency, then there are people feeding from that inefficiency. So those people, especially if they are in, 
in, in, in, in, in the rankings of like uh, more managerial positions. I mean, they wish things don't change forever, like because technology, when technology kicks in, uh, you see less inefficiencies, so you see less people, uh, so you see less people and more data. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, they need to have a very good understanding of the of the uh, stakeholder environment of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And uh, one last thing would be to for especially sports entrepreneurs. I mean, I see it as a 360 ecosystem again. Like if you know people that sell to a club or they sell to any part of the ecosystem, uh, they need to, they need to uh, form very good partnerships yeah. because you can only sell in this ecosystem as long as you, uh, you, you establish good partnerships. That also includes media. So I would, I would, I would rather leverage on collaborative sales efforts. efforts yeah. Would you like to introduce Barush? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Who's next to you, one of your so, best friends. <laughs> yeah, as, as he's the, uh, as he's the uh, one behind 2-0 as well. Uh, so, yeah, okay, let me try yeah. to bridge to exactly. him. So, once we started investing in sports ERP, Scaltium, uh, different sports technologies that we naively thought would be very beneficial for any sports club to use, we, we came across this uh, I would say we, we didn't anticipate it, but we came across this uh, unwillingness to transform. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, we would talk to clubs, we would talk, talk to ecosystem professionals, and then we said, you know, I mean, it's going to take maybe 50 years to change some of the clubs, so why not invest in a club uh, that we define our, like 2 0 version and uh, implement all those technologies? within a sports club and create value. I think Morish is going to talk more about that. Uh, yeah. Yes, Barish. I mean, this was, I, when I heard this, this was uh, the best strategy to invest. And that's why I would like to know about more about sports and yourself first. Yeah. OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, we have a company called Sports, uh, which is an, I call an investment vehicle for, again, sports related uh, assets. but not like the only technology-based assets to, to zero invest, but we have a different mandate. And it's also complementary uh, to to zero fund that they invest into minority shares, startups, cash burning companies with a vision of uh, financial return uh, and target of financial return. On the sports side, uh, it explained it a little bit, but this vertical sports media and entertainment creates too much synergy uh, I believe uh, yeah. among other verticals because when you talk about a football club you can say okay this is a sports business yeah it's a media business yes it's an entertainment business so you cannot differentiate whether it's a media sometimes media asset sports asset or entertainment asset so what we have decided to invest into a conventional assets through the new vehicle called sports that we have created with our more than 30 investors. B, majority shares of uh, technology companies related to sports and media. And what we have done, the first investment out of sports was a minority investment in, into a Turkish club, Göztepe, now plays in the second division, but when we have invested, it was in the Super League. And uh, let's say thanks to its management, it's the first club that is uh, acquired by an international group in Turkey. So yes. we are still a minority investor there, but the club uh, uh, is, let's say, changed its ownership with our investment because, you know, when you have a fund invest into a club or a company, it's like a stamp on it that there is a corporate governance. Uh, applying within that club, more transparency, more sustainability. So after our stamp, one and a half years later, the club was sold to a foreign inst uh, institutional investor. The second investment was a majority investor investment in a second division club in the Netherlands. It's called FC Dordrecht. So uh, this is another conventional asset, a football club owned by sports. Then we have acquired majority shareholding in a Turkish uh, 
technology company, sports technology company called Machkolik. Uh, I believe most of the uh, uh, Turkish people who are football enthusiastic using that application and that website to follow the uh, live scores of games and data and statistics. Um, then we did, uh, with much colleague came the French subsidy called Match and Drake, the same business, second largest in, in uh, France. In a nutshell, uh, that's what we invest into sports media sets, sports clubs and conventional sports assets as a majority. I still think that sports investment is not really so clear. And we unfortunately don't talk too much about sports investments. So uh, yesterday we went to the fifth pro and we had there also a very good um, insight, I would say, from um, Andrea from Football Benchmark. And that's why I think it's great that, first of all, you guys do this. You are engaged in this area and you invest. So I would like to know, can you maybe describe a little bit the scene of sports investment and also tell us how does your investment strategy differs from other club investors? Uh, actually, uh, I'm coming from finance business, so I'm not in uh, sports. I don't have a sports background. So I think me and my colleagues have a different approach to football clubs or other businesses because there is the, let's say, third party opinion not coming from the directly from the industry. And with our experience in the Turkish club and the Dutch club, uh, we realized that, of course, we knew it uh, before investing, but we need to uh, create another route to the club, a different direction than other club crowds, let's say hundreds of clubs within the ecosystem. Because, you know, when people invest into a sports club or a football club, the first target is the, let's say, success on the pitch, the scores, the rankings, the, the, the standings, whatever. So that approach always uh, gives you a handicap. Uh, it creates a handicap that you cannot directly focus on the business side of the investment. So when we were deciding to invest into a football club, we had a definition of a club 2.0, second version of a football club that will be uh, that will be self-sustained in the long term, but not on the pitch scores is the pri priority, top priority, but off the pitch investments will pay us in the long term. So what we have done, different than the most of the club investments, we didn't focus on the uh, scores or on the pitch results of the club. We didn't change everything regarding to our knowledge, whatever you call it. So just give you an example. When we acquired FC Dordrecht, they were at the bottom of the league. 20th, then came 19th, 18th. So we are not chasing to go uh, in, let's say, the first, uh, we call it left row of the standing chart. But what we have done, instead of focusing on the pitch results, we are now trying to uh, create the digitalization of the club, community building. I call it not a fan base building, but a community building around the region, new. Uh, because they had a, a diminished fan base, creating a fan base, getting engaged with the fans, existing fans and new fans. So that's where we uh, focused. The project was called Energic Dort because Dordrecht is very close to Rotterdam. It's, an, mm -hmm. uh, it's known as an energy hub in, the Europe, uh, in Europe. So there are too many companies, uh, people working for energy companies around the region. Uh, the first hiring was a guy, his post was innovation manager. He is the second highest uh, executive position within the club. He is not a football manager, he is not a sports manager, but he is an innovation manager. What he has done, he created a project for a community building called Energic Door, coming from the energy uh, background of the region. So we are slowly building a community support that will also bring us new fans, new engagement with the people in the region, then new sponsors, then sustainability to club. Now, last year we were focused on this energy door project with the innovation manager. This year's motto will be the digitalization of the club. 
Okay, mm -hmm. so then came will come the uh, on the pitch results, I believe. So that's the second focus of uh, our business investment. So I believe that's the main difference from other club investors around the globe. When you when you explain already, it's so clear how complex it is. Because a lot of clubs, especially after the pandemic, got hit very hard financially and they think now there comes the investor, shuts in 200 million euros and then everything is solved. No, it's not. We really see you have to establish really structures. There's a lot of fights, I think, also in the management, you know, with the staff, with the old staff, recruiting. And then also, like what you say, like implementation of these uh, strategies and technology is not that easy. That takes so much. And I think your your project with the energy just took a couple of years. Two years, you know? almost two years. Yeah, I see. So it is a process, but uh, it's definitely a sustainable and long-term process. And everybody thinks, okay, uh, fan engagement, but the f also fan engagement is um, evolving very fast, you know, with digitalization. So what do you think is um, this kind of evolvement of fan engagement? How does this influence your strategy, you know, and future investments? Sure, that's a million dollar question. Of course, yeah. uh, everything is evolving yes. faster than we envisaged before Corona. That's for sure on the digital side. And football is the one of the hardest hit uh, areas through the pandemic. But it's not only football, but you know, all I believe the entertainment and the media will change because content is the king, we call it. That's why we have also established 2.0. So football business is a content for people. They just consume the content. Now, when you go back to 20 years ago, there were two games on the TV you were watching, then maybe going to a game, I don't know, once a month. That's, that was the only engagement of people with the clubs or the sports businesses. Now it's not like that. You have your mobile phone that you can go to the app of the club. You can interact with the club, interact with other fans. So it's an endless story, but just it's this infancy period. I believe from now, maybe five years time or 10 years time, the fans will be, a, let's say, a part of the club, a part of the business. It's not like 12, 11 people on the pitch playing a game, but mm -hmm. it will be a community creating something, I call it a content together. So at the end, it will evolve there. I don't know how, because there are new technologies coming, new startups coming, everybody has an idea. I mean, maybe, you know, one comes with an application that engages fans within the game, and other comes, they just trying to, uh, gamify fan experience other is coming with another idea so that will there's a like a call uh, when it rains it pours now it's like that many ideas coming many startups coming so some will uh, change the whole industry for sure some will go away so what we are trying to do we are trying to find which will be successful and uh, helpful for our investments so it's a long-term run i believe yeah. but the time is running quickly we'll see but as i told you fans will be not only fans anymore they will be an integrated part of the football clubs or sports clubs that's a unique point exactly so now we have perfect two examples <laughs> of your investment <laughs> we want athletic performance wise scoutium and then we have entertainment i would say right your your um, so I think we should start with you, Ali, you know, because it's now with the club management side, let's move to your investment. So mm -hmm. first, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Scoutium. Hello, uh, my name is Ali Akçay. I am the managing partner of Scoutium. Uh, I was working with Barış and Yiğit uh, back in the day with 2.0. Right now I'm in charge of Scoutium. Uh, what we do in Scoutium is, uh, according to FIFA reports, there are 45 million licensed players in the world, but we are only able to see 100,000 of them, 150,000 of them, because only those players' matches are broadcasted live uh, via TV channels, via some OTT platforms, etc. But beyond these, I mean, there are 44.9 million players in the world. 
which are coming from academy level and amateur level. So Scoutium uh, found its way that because they wanted to show every every player's skills, every talent uh, in the world to every shareholder in the football business. So that's why Scoutium uh, is founded. Uh, and started in Turkey. Uh, yeah, started yes. in Turkey. We started in Turkey. We are now operating in Turkey and Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of our operations are now in Turkey. We are trying to uh, make all academy players visible, uh, all amateur players visible. Uh, that's what Scouting is. That's my next question. I was yeah. going to ask you, like, how does your platform uh, ensure that talents from all over the world gets this equal visibility and um, opportunity to be seen, you know? Can you just explain? Because it's very detailed. It's yeah. a tech um, and an application I think you have right now. Or uh, Scoutium is a company, a company where uh, technology uh, combines with operation because uh, in order to show all these talents, all these skills, everything of these players, you need to be everywhere. Uh, we right now have uh, have video recorders, mm -hmm. with some video record experts in every city in Turkey, which gives us power to take the match videos and then uh, analyze those matches and uh, show everything possible, like uh, the videos, video uh, and uh, other statistical uh, data to both federations, clubs and players itself. Um, we have two platforms available right now, uh, which is one is on the web, one is for uh, one is on the mobile application. Uh, web platform is for our B2B clients, which are federations, clubs, some agents, maybe. And uh, this platform is something similar to Y Scout and Instat. Uh, we are trying to show the match videos, 90-minute match videos, efficient. Uh, match videos or some players' uh, videos, etc., to uh, these shareholders. And the uh, mobile application part, uh, it's only open to licensed players right now mm -hmm. uh, and only open to some other uh, operations that we do with some clubs. For example, we are now in football school business. There's this concept of football schools in Turkey. Um, we are also open to the players from this coming from football schools. Um, what we do is we, go, we, we the operation works both ways. A club a federation can ask for us, can request a match video from another from uh, every city in Turkey. Uh, in 72 hours, we go to the match, we record the match, and we do the analysis and we provide everything possible to the shareholder. And also, I think the most important part of Scoutium is that players are able to uh, ask us to go to their matches, uh, which gives the uh, opportunity to uh, show their skills, like the, uh, they are able to show, show their skills, show their uh, talents uh, to clubs, federations, that, which gives away the shadow uh, in, in, uh, on them, and uh, we are giving like the spotlight to them. Uh, that's why uh, Scoutium is, uh, sorry, uh, Scoutium, <laughs> uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, play, players, yeah. Okay. Players are also requesting yes. us to go to their matches. Yeah. We go there. We go there. We request. We take the match, and we do analysis. When one guy asks us to go to the matches, we record 30 players, which gives okay. us enormous amount of data, enormous amount of players. Right now, in Scoutium database, we have more than 100,000 players, uh, individual analysis. I mean, in Turkey, Amazing. there are uh, only 300,000 licensed players, and also uh, 35,000 of them are registered to Scouty mobile application right now, which gives us power to, you know, uh, communicate with them with like just one push notification. Uh, they are using our system to see their match videos, their statistics, their uh, auto-generated notes, mm -hmm. and also we are giving the giving the opportunity to reach the needs they have. Uh, at the easiest way, like the cheapest and the easiest way, because since we have this community uh, of licensed players, we are we are so we are considered to be a target market 
for some companies. For example, we made an agreement with uh, one of Tur Nike's distributors in Turkey, and we gave 20% uh, off on each uh, item available on the website. So with all these stuff, we are giving equal opportunity to players to both show their skills, get discovered, and uh, get everything he needs or she needs yes, in order to exactly. become a professional football player. That's, I think, the uh, most important part of Scoutium. Yes, and I think the, what I liked about the new approach of Scoutium is that you also start from the football schools, you know, where really our talent started. And yeah. I see very talented six and nine years old already in these schools, and then they can make it to academy, and already there, the parents are already, they want to know like the performance of my, ch my child and they want to get more assistance, you know, from coaches. Sometimes they can't get, but at least from your application they can, yeah. you know. And some, some parents are also former professional players, like football players, they are um, sending their kids there. So I think it's a great combination also to start um, with the football schools, you know. But I know that most of these uh, talents out there they would probably would like to know, like, is there any features that could help predict a player's future? You know, can we say something? Yeah, it's Calcium. Uh, user base is ranging between age of 8 to 18. So mm -hmm. we can say that easily 10 years of age uh, of user base is now available in Scoutium. So in the following five years, 10 years, today, one of our players, let's say at 15 years, he will become 20 years old and we will see how, uh, how good he become in his professional football life or even did he become a professional football player. So since the journey starts very early age right now, for example, we are uh, doing this uh, agreement with Turkish, one of the biggest clubs in Turkey. We will be, we will be recording their game from each month mm -hmm. uh, from football schools. Then we will analyze him from like the age of six. And then he will, he, he will be in the system of Scoutium until he becomes a professional player, which That's will amazing. be an enormous amount of data set. And then, then we will be able to both say, uh, one of the play that that player was not a licensed player when he was at football school. Firstly, if he is he if he uh, we can predict the probability of his uh, becoming a licensed player in academies in the first time, and then if he is an academy player, licensed player, become a professional football player. Those are both different concepts, but Scoutium will be able to uh, predict in the future, in like five years, 10 years, predict the probability of player uh, to become a professional football player. And also right now there's uh, new medical uh, startups are also emerging, you know, and uh, all these DNA tests, uh, some other uh, conditioning tests, etc. Uh, in the future, we are hoping to combine all these DNA tests, uh, fitness tests and all statistical mm -hmm. uh, data together uh, to, pre to predict more accurate uh, probability of uh, each individual in our system to become a professional football player. I think... Uh, and provide our, more service yeah. to the, for the players. Yeah, you know. for, for the players. Yeah, all in one, kind of. And also to, you know, right now, uh, in order to make an investment in players in those uh, age range, uh, clubs need to better understand the probability of the player to become, because they want to invest in the right player, yes. maybe. So, not, I mean, not only investing, but also developing uh, the player. So, scouting will be able to uh, give this probability in the near future. Perfect. So, now we talk about performance. And I also know that you're looking for future investors to invest into Scoutium. Yeah. So we will talk ab at the end, I will get to Yeet back. But now I want to talk about this amazing fantasy football, esports slash gaming slash right, <laughs> NFT right. blockchain. I know you have a lot to say, Özgür, because you're so uh, very experienced. So please, thank you. Well, introduce uh, yourself. Uh, I'm Özgür Gündoğan, uh, a little bit about myself first. Uh, 
I have worked in several uh, positions as a uh, sports manager, uh, I, including uh, sales and marketing director at Galatasaray, uh, founder general manager of Paso League, um, commercial director of Saudi Pro League, uh, and CEO of Göztepe, and I've been uh, a board member of sports, sports investments for about two years. And now I'm uh, the general manager of fantasy gaming technologies. Entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, actually, it has a story. <laughs> it has a story. Uh, almost two years ago, I mean, back in uh, November uh, 2021, uh, after the successful acquisition of Match Colleague by mm -hmm. Sports, um, actually we decided uh, to acquire uh, a gaming company as well. Mm -hmm. Because considering uh, 12 million users of Match Colleague, uh, we needed uh, to present them a, a social sports game as well. Uh, because we, we knew that they were very engaged with with football, with sports, uh, but ma mainly in football. And uh, what is more engaging? It's sports gaming. So, uh, and after deciding uh, to acquire uh, a fantasy sports game, we met with several companies, several app owners, uh, for for about two or three months, and and we found out that uh, most of the games in in the market, I mean both uh, domestic market and international markets, uh, most of them were old school, uh, were developed uh, with old school technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you, if you don't have the latest technology and you know, m most uh, updated uh, technology, uh, you, you don't have a chance to survive uh, in the modern world, uh, even if you have the best game in the world. So, so then we decided to uh, to be entrepreneurs and you know to uh, and this uh, idea of uh, a new startup fantasy came up uh, and after deciding this uh, we started uh, to develop our game and we uh, we cut deals with all the Turkish uh, football clubs uh, through clubs union uh, mm -hmm. through Klubler Birliği. it was an easy process because you need to you know convince each club one by one uh, and we launched our first game uh, in September uh, 2022. Uh, and then since then, um, we, we earned over 150,000 uh, users playing the game. And we also developed two more games, uh, which one, uh, one of them is Fantasy XI and the other one is Pixlam, uh, to, to expand our coverage. So, so yeah, that, that's the story. Oh, that's first the story, how it all started. Yeah, how it so started, yeah. Everybody will probably ask you about Soraya, you know, your competitor, your international. Can you just give us a little peek to understand this whole ecosystem? Well, yes, actually. In the, sports games? Um, the most popular game is a Premier League's game, mm -hmm. a Fantasy Premier League, uh, but also, you know, Sorare uh, two years ago uh, made a big move and entered the market uh, with, with their NFTs. Uh, and now they're like the market leader in terms of uh, NFT related uh, sports game. Uh, actually, Sorare is not uh, really like a game. It's like a, it's like a marketplace, NFT marketplace. So you invest in some players and you, you buy the, their NFT cars and you, 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 as, they, uh, as the player uh, gain value or develop them, themselves, uh, you, you try to sell those cards uh, at the NFT marketplace. So it's, it's, and also with the players you have, you earn some points, there's a competition, but it's like, it's, uh, it's, it's like secondary. The, 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 the main uh, target is there, the marketplace. So, uh, but game-wise, uh, the real competitor is uh, Fantasy uh, Premier League, mm -hmm. which has all over 8 million users around the world. Uh, it's just 
Premier League uh, players and uh, it's a season-wide uh, competition. So uh, I, I don't see both of them as direct competitors because I think we have a more advanced game uh, and our coverage is supreme. It's not only football, we will also cover basketball, mo uh, motor sports, uh, and baseball, and hockey, and, and the other sports as well. So, uh, I mean, technology-wise, coverage-wise, and game-wise, we, uh, we're way different. Why, why I ask like this, because for a sport, a fan, the fan gets like mixed up. He's like, what is fantasy football? What is NFT? What is yes, a blockchain? Yes. Oh, yeah. For those interested. who have never played yes. uh, a fantasy football game, uh, it's basically you have your own team uh, and you, you select your formation first uh, and then you pick your players for your team. So uh, Then let me ask you already the question then. Right. How do you see the future of fantasy football? evolving with these advancements in, in technology? Well, we want everything and we want them now, right? Yes. So, so it's the model of this new, new century. So, uh, and and this, this, is, this goes the same for, uh, for uh, gaming industry as well, especially fantasy sports. Uh, so, uh, so technology, uh, we, we heavily rely on our technology because as Messi scores and if Messi is in your team, mm -hmm. the, the, the user wants to see that Messi scored and this is the contribution uh, to my team and this is, my, uh, this is where I stand in the general standings and they want it at the same time. So as Messi scores, we pull the data from Opta mm -hmm. We calculate all those points, and we calculate the points of the teams, and we uh, make the standings of all the thousands of teams in, in seconds. I mean, mm -hmm. so uh, technology is is uh, is very very important. It's key to, to these games. So uh, I, I think as the technology grows, uh, users will be able to. You know, engage more. I mean, with, with VR technologies, with AR technologies, with mm -hmm. lots of technologies, we, we, I think uh, all the games will try to implement these technologies. Uh, right now, we're just on the data side, but visually, uh, it will improve as well. So, so it's all about engagement. I mean, then let's I mean, go to 20, the... yeah, 20 years ago, I, we were not engaged. Yes, exactly. But now we are very engaged by the help of social media. But this engagement is still not enough. People want to be players, mm -hmm. be active players in, in this game. So kind of sports games are, are the key uh, elements to it. Because, because everybody is then asking like blockchain, NFTs, like what is this? Like what's the, what is for you the rise of blockchains considering <coughs> integration into technology of the game, collectibles, rewards? Can you summarize it in, in two minutes? <laughs> Well, uh, of course, it's, it's coming. I mean, it's yeah. al already here, the NFTs, yeah. blo blockchain, and uh, the tokens. So, but it's, it's not very easy to utilize them I I in a game. Uh, there are lots of play-to-earn games uh, for, uh, uh, for Web3. Uh, but uh, engagement-wise, our first approach is uh, to use these uh, tokens uh, in the awarding system. Because we have players everywhere in the world. And, and most of the players play these games for awards, to reach those awards. And exactly. the easiest way to send the awards is through tokens. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy to send a PlayStation uh, to, uh, to, to another country, but it's very easy to send a, a token, a fan token, uh, to another country. So in, in the awarding system, it's a, extremely important. But also in the elements in the uh, game, uh, uh, you can you can uh, make the NFTs uh, of these elements, and you know then you know with the hype of NFTs and with the use of N NFTs, uh, it can be uh, a very exciting journey for the players. But uh, it's not going as fast as uh, the development of blockchain. The, the I mean the the usage uh, in the games. So it will take a, a couple of more years. But yeah. 
we will Thank heavily you. rely on. Uh, we have. We. I saw Sam Rowdy telling me that we are unfortunately out of our time, but I think that topic definitely needs an own session and NFTs and blockchain. Hopefully next time. Um, I know Scoutium is looking for investors. You are open for investment as well for investors to join. They can contact Yeet directly, but they can also come to us and ask us. You know, we're here um, also for lunch. So thank you very much for thank participating. You. And thank you guys for listening. <laughs> it was a pleasure to be here. <laughs>